first ship to be built from scratch as a cruise ship was from the Hamburg America line in 1900. And they built a rather modest ship, the Princess and Victoria Louise. And she would sail out of Hamburg on various cruises to the Baltic and the Mediterranean and further afield. So she was about 8,000 tons, less than half the size of the Great Eastern. But she was the first ship purpose built for cruising. Now we have to look at class distinctions and the different classes that passenger ships catered for. And on liner voyages, you would invariably have first class passengers. And these were the well to do business owners, aristocrats and the like. Second class would be professional people such as school teachers or lecturers. Third class would be economy passengers, maybe students. And then there would all, always or often be another class called steerage. And this was the emigrant class. And rather than having dedicated cabins, these people would be housed in large dormitories. Now we jump to 1907, early years of the 20th century, but a real big sea change in the technology. Steam turbines had been introduced into marine engineering and naval architecture, and the largest and fastest ships in the world, the two sister ships, the Cunard Lusitania and Mauritania. And these ships were about 30,000 gross tons. And we'll talk a little bit more about gross tons and size of ships later on. But they were just under twice the size of the Great Eastern, fastest passenger ships in the world, sailing between Southampton and New York, and also at the beginning of their lives in, in, in Liverpool. Now, a great rival to Cunard was the White Star Line. And in order to compete with Cunard, White Star built the Olympic class. And this was a class of three ships. The first one entered service in 1911, the Olympic. The third one was the Britannic, which entered service during the First World War as a hospital ship. And whereas Olympic lasted until 1935 and was broken up, the Britannic sadly was sunk during the First World War when she hit a mine in the Aegean. The second ship of the trio was, of course, the famous Titanic. And she sank on her maiden voyage with the loss of nearly 1,500 passengers, the largest maritime disaster up until that time. And in fact, the problem with Titanic and the design of all those early 20th century ships was that they'd grown in size so quickly that the regulations hadn't really kept up with the great increase in size. And the regulations at the time for British ships were regulated by the Board of Trade, and they stipulated the number of watertight bulkheads required in a ship based on the ship length. And they also stipulated similarly the number of lifeboat places on board. So the number of places in the lifeboats bore no relation to the number of passengers on board. But the Titanic and her sad loss would greatly change how ships were designed and operated once all the maritime nations grouped together to produce some international regulations. And those regulations were the safety of life at sea. And the initial regulations were formulated in 1914, and they were about to be ratified and come into force when the First World War erupted and sadly, it prevented the rules from being um, enforced. And it wasn't until 1929 that the maritime nations came together and produced the first set of real safety of life at sea regulations. 
And this was updated in 1948 after the Second World War, again in 1960. And we are now working on the fourth iteration, the 1974 regulations. But unlike the earlier regulations that were changed by a wholesale change of the whole group, nowadays, just parts of the regulations are updated. For example, those regulations pertaining to fire safety or flooding, they're now looked at piecemeal as deemed required. And it's these regulations that we now use as the Bible in designing and operating crews and all types of passenger ships today. Now I'd like to return back to the rivalry on the North Atlantic in the period before the First World War, because we have Cunard with the Lusitania Mauritania, the White Star Line with the Olympic class, but the Hamburg America line in Germany built a group of ships called the Imperator class. And this is quite an important class as we will see in a moment. So their first new ship in 1911, laid down 1911, entered service 1913 was the Imperator. And she eventually became the Berengaria after the First World War. The third ship was the Bismarck which became the Majestic. And if you look at the picture there of the Berengaria or the Imprata, you can see that there's a large eagle stuck on the forward end of the ship. And that was put there to make the ship the longest passenger ship in the world. Because at the time Cunard were building this ship, the Aquitania, that was to run with Lusitania and Mauritania, and she would have been a few feet longer than the Imprata. And so that the Hamburg America line could claim that their ship was the longest ship in the world, they fixed that large bronze eagle on the front of their ship so that they could um, outpace the, uh, the Aquitania. Sadly, the eagle didn't last very long because in, a, in an Atlantic storm, it was swept from the ship and it was never replaced. Now, the second ship of that trio is important for the United States because the, the second ship was originally called the Vaterland. It entered service just a, a few weeks before the First World War, did one or two trips to New York before the First World War erupted. And then the ship was seized by the United States government and she was eventually renamed Leviathan. And she was rebuilt by the eminent naval architect, William Francis Gibbs, who we will see more of a bit later in the lecture. So the Leviathan, the old Vaterland, was the United States first real superliner. And we see here one of the first class dining areas and the sort of opulence that passengers would enjoy in the first class and the nightclub done to a, a quite modern style for the 1920s when the ship re-entered service with the United States lines. And it's during the interwar period between the First and Second World War that cruising began to really take off Blue Star Line had introduced a series of moderately sized passenger cargo ships on the run from the UK down to the River Plate to carry meat and, and passengers. But they quickly found that their ambitions were rather larger than what the market could warrant and sustain. So they re rebuilt one of their ships into a purpose-built uh, or a special cruise liner the Arandora Star. So only two years after entering service, that ship was converted into a dedicated cruise ship. And she was very, very successful in the UK market. Royal Mail Line 
which also traveled out from the UK down to South America. They opted to convert one of their older ships that uh, dated from 1913 into a cruise ship called the Atlantis. And she was also very, very popular in the United Kingdom for cruising at that time. But cruising took on another significance during the Great Depression. And of course, the United States at the time had prohibition. And so the passenger ships that had very few passengers traveling across the Atlantic, rather than keeping them idle, the steamship companies decided to run their ships out of New York down to the Bahamas or further afield to the Caribbean on short pleasure cruises. And because they could sail outside of US territorial waters, so into international waters, they were allowed to sell liquor. And hence the popular name came that these cruises were actually booze cruises. And they were exceedingly popular with the United States clientele. And they certainly kept a number of these older passenger ships in service with the steamship lines. Now, throughout the 1920s and 1930s, it really was the halcyon times for passenger ships, the so-called ships of state, where each of the countries within Europe maritime countries was, was trying to outdo each other to build the largest and the fastest liners connecting the old world with the new. And so in 1929 and 1930, the North Dirkshire Lloyd German shipping company based in Bremen, they built the Bremen and the Europa to be followed a few years later by the Italians who built the Rex. And each of these three ships, the Bremen, Europa and Rex, in its time, was the fastest transatlantic liner on the Atlantic. And then probably the, the two greatest ships before the Second World War were the famed Normandy and the Queen Mary. Normandy was greatly subsidized by the French government to be a showcase of French art technology and decoration, whereas Queen Mary was entirely financed by the Cunard Company. Although they had a government loan, that loan had to be paid back and they didn't have the operating subsidy that the Normandy had. But these two ships vied with each other for the honors of crossing the North Atlantic and they could make the transatlantic crossing in about three days from Europe over to the United States. Many of the passenger ships were used as troop ships during the Second World War. Many of them sadly were lost. And in fact, the Queen Mary's running mate was the Queen Elizabeth that entered service in 1940 as a troop ship. And then after the Second World War, she was reconditioned as a passenger ship and entered service in 1947. 